Sometimes when I find an interesting product on eBay, I'll buy a selection of the items to see if there's any variation. And sometimes I'll buy the cheapest that I can find just to see what they've done to get the price down. And whereas most of these, uh, this is one of the cheapy ones and it's just intriguing because it somehow managed to be shit and amazing at the same time. This is what I'd normally expect from these uh, emergency style lamps. These are the lamps that you plug them into a lamp holder and they've got a battery inside and they charge uh, the battery up while the, they're powered as well as lighting the lamp. And then when there's a power failure, they'll detect continuity through the switch wires and they'll turn the light on when the, you close the switch. And in most instances, it's quite complex circuitry. In this instance, the circuitry is breathtakingly simple. Let's take a closer look at that. I'll just put the proper posh one out the way and get the photo of the particularly shit and amazing one in. So this has, for a start, a, I mean, I'm guessing it's a sealed lead acid battery. It certainly has the characteristics of one. And you're thinking, why would they use that above lithium, like a lithium polymer or lithium ion cell, like an 18650? And I guess that maybe because of the success of lithium batteries, the sealed lead acid manufacturers are uh, struggling a bit, so maybe they're putting them out cheaper, they're trying to compete, don't know. It's a very odd choice. So we've got the sealed lead acid battery, we've got an electrolytic, and we've got a uh, dropper capacitor here, a metal film capacitor. The rest of the circuitry involves a bridge rectifier. If there was a Zener diode here, you may see there's a slight skid mark around here. I had a bit of an incident. I was testing the voltage of that. And in doing so, I was using my tongs, your bass, uh, and just basically I clamped it across the component and uh, turned the voltage up to the point that it started conducting, except I made a bad connection at some point, turned the voltage up a bit too high, uh, wiggled the connections, it, it, suddenly the LED glowed, the uh, LED, the Zener glowed red hot in the middle, and there's a loud pop and a spark came off it. And it was no more, so that's why it's off the circuit board. But it doesn't matter. I, I worked out it was quite a high value. Um, we've got uh, a diode, uh, a little capacitor here, and then a MOSFET. And the rest is just resistors. It really is just the most amazingly simple circuit. And it's also abusing that battery horrifically. So let's uh, initially power this up and take a look at it. So uh, I've got my hoppy here. Let's stuff the wires into these speaker terminals that are live at mains voltage when it's powered up. That sounds like a good idea. And I'll show that uh, when you bridge them out, a group of LEDs, a group of eight LEDs lights, not all the LEDs like in the other units. And when I plug this in, the outer LEDs light and the middle ones sort of glow at lower intensity. So what I'm reading here in the hoppy meter is I'm reading 92 milliamps, uh, the current voltage, local voltage is 245 volts, and it says it's 4.8 watts, so let's say 5 watts. The power factor is horrific at 0 0.2, but that's what you'd expect off this capacitive dropper circuitry. And what that basically means is that uh, if your power meter is monitoring for watts, then it, this will be equivalent of running a 5 watt load. If it's a uh, measuring reactive power, you, your electricity company will uh, charge you about 23 watts for this same lamp. The reason the LEDs in the middle are not glowing very brightly compared to the ones on the outside is quite an interesting and intriguing bit of circuitry. I shall show you this. I shall get the hoppy out the way. And I shall bring in the method I used to reverse engineer this. To reverse engineer it, I printed it out and uh, faded the image down and then drew all the tracks in. It was quite complex. It's notable that these LEDs here are all in parallel. It takes a bit of actually tracing out to find that. And they're all in parallel except this one, which is in series, and all these other ones around the edge are in series. They're the main sort of illumination ones. But uh, the reason we've got this parallel and series arrangement is all very clever. Um, I shall get the schematic, and we can take a look at this. I'll divide it down into what happens at each section uh, of operation. So we've got the standard capacitive dropper, and if we just ignore the circuitry over here, it looks like an ordinary sort of LED lamp. You've got the capacitive dropper with a really high value 1.3 microfarad capacitor, and it goes through this uh, rectifier, noting that there are 
two resistors bypassing the rectifier for the sensing function. There's a capacitor, 47 microfarad, 100 volt, and then there's a zener and a 10k resistor. The reason for the zener, and I think it's quite a high value, around about 40 volts, is so that uh, when the unit is... Uh, let me think, what, what's the reason for that zener? Yes, it's when the unit is off, it has to be well above the the voltage that you're not going to get any leakage through because there's effectively a diode through this. If you didn't have that zener in series with the capacitor discharge resistor, then it would potentially bring the lamp on when it wasn't supposed to be on. And uh, once you've got that, so we've got the capacitive dropper, the rectifier, the smoothing capacitor, the zener and discharge resistor, and then it's a series array of LEDs, except for the oddity that it goes through this series, then there's a resistor as a sort of uh, surge and in rush a limiter, but they're also using that as a link. And then there's these two groups of LEDs here. And the reason they've got a, a tap-off from these two groups of LEDs and a diode is because they're basically treating that as a, a 6-volt reference with the two combined 3-volt from the LED and using it to charge the, uh, the battery through a diode. And there's no regulation. And here's the odd bit. Now, see, this does look to all intents and purposes to be a sealed lead-acid battery. If you get a screwdriver and you kind of pop the cap off this, I might have to use my spudger for that. Uh, this is where the spudger is not visible. There it is. There it is. Oh, actually, you know what? The screwdriver might be better. I've just suddenly realised that we've got this little lip at the back. So you pop that off and there are two little rubber caps and when you shine the light down, I'm kind of intrigued with this battery, you can see this sort of I'm not sure if you're going to see this, but inside there, let's say it zoomed down a bit Inside there is a sort of the uh, absorbent material that absorbs the acid in these. The difference between sealed lead acid and standard lead acid batteries is that uh, the sealed ones have an absorbent material. They're designed for operation in any orientation. So they have something like, usually some sort of fiberglass wadding or uh, I suppose polyester wadding would work. And it keeps the acid in suspension so that, you know it can be tipped upside down without pouring out. But um, they have no regulation, and technically speaking, the sealed lead acids, traditional car lead acid batteries have six cells in them, this is two, they're typically about two volts a cell, and they'll start taking a charge from about 2.15 volts, and the upper threshold of charge voltage should be, normally be 2.35 volts, beyond that, uh, once it's charged up fully, you're going to end up with outgassing. The electrolyte is going to start bubbling and producing hydrogen and oxygen. And it's going to vent out and dry out. In the case of the upper 2.35 volt uh, limit, if you consider a car with its six sections, six times two for the rough 12 volt rating times 2.35, it gives a sort of upper charge voltage of around about 14 volts. Most uh, Traditional car battery chargers charge up to about 13.8 volts and then start trickle charging after that. Um, in this case, the voltage went up to about 5.6 volts, which is a lot more because technically speaking, the maximum voltage should have been 4.7 volts, but there is no regulation. So I guess if you just left this light all, lit all the time, it would probably vent off the electrolyte. You might end up oozing uh, vapour, hydrogen and oxygen, possibly even oozing some acid out of this. Not sure. Um, the circuitry then gets quite complex in the sense that it's simple, but it is complex. When you turn this lamp off, you've got a MOSFET here across the battery, and it's in series with the, the battery is one end is reference to the negative of these cluster of parallel LEDs. And there's a resistor here, 3.9 ohm, and it's pulled positive through this MOSFET to turn the LEDs on. And in the case of when it's been powered down and it's detecting continuity through the lamp cap, the current path for that is that the MOSFET is actually being pulled up positive. It's a P-channel MOSFET. It's been pulled up positive to keep it turned off. And then it needs to be pulled negative. So it goes through this 1 megohm resistor, goes through the 330k discharge resistor, then it goes through the loads and then comes back through this 150k resistor to the negative rail and that effectively pulls that MOSFET 
gate down to the negative rail with this slight filtering capacitor and it turns the LEDs on. I can demonstrate that now just by shorting these wires out. I've done that already, but I'll do it again. And uh, what I was thinking here was what protects the gate? Or what keeps this turned off when the unit's plugged into the mains? Because uh, if you consider it, this is tapped off one of the AC connections. So it forms a sort of potential divider between the battery and this resistor and this resistor. So theoretically, it would go up to about 120 volts or so, and that would grossly exceed this MOSFET's capability, its gate separation. You've got a couple of uh, voltages you have to watch out for with MOSFETs. One is uh, the, uh, gate, the gate to uh, drain and source voltage, because you can damage this super thin layer of insulation. And also you have to consider the voltage between the uh, drain and source, which is these two connections here. And initially I thought that was going to exceed that. But then when you consider it, because this is AC and because there's a capacitor here, effectively it forms a, a very simple filter. It's got the resistor and the capacitor and it, it on each half wave, it has to alter, change the polarity across this capacitor. And when you measure it, let me bring this in. Let me actually bring the quick test in and I'll measure it, the AC voltage across that. So let's bring in the quick test. Here it is. And I shall dazzle myself by trying to probe out the circuit board while it's live. So we'll turn this to AC. I'll get the circuit board, ram it in here. Note where the capacitor I want to test is because I'm going to be dazzled when this is lit. And I shall turn that round and I shall plug it in. Oh, let's uh, get it upright first. Oh, let's gingerly get it upright because it is live now. Oh, that's not going to work. Right, tell you what, I'll just probe it where it is then. So if I probe across that capacitor, try not to short anything out here. I get a mean voltage, AC voltage of just 1.1 volts, which means that typically at any time, with reference to ground, it's only rising approximately one volt above the zero volt rail. And there is a DC bias in this as well, I noticed, which is odd. It's quite a high DC bias, but it's actually biasing the MOSFET off. They have just done miracles to make this work with such a low component count. I don't know if they specifically designed it like this or they were just patching, you know, plugging components into breadboard and trying things out and it just kind of worked. But it's actually very clever. So it's definitely one of those uh, miracle designs it, with uh, pros and cons. The pro is that the mega simplicity of the switching circuitry and the con is the fact that this little lead acid battery is potentially being grossly overcharged. So now what I want to do, well, what I want to do right now is short out, keep my fingers well clear connections here, short out that capacitor. This will make a pop usually. Oh, it didn't actually, unless I've made a bad connection there. It usually does. Oh, it did make a pop and brings LEDs on momentarily. That's another weird, uh, weird quirk. Because I've discharged that uh, capacitor now, it will gradually trickle charge through the circuitry and those LEDs will gradually go off again. Quite interesting. But now I want to get the gloves on because this is full of acid and I want to try opening this. So I'm just going to do that right now. Explosion containment pie dish on standby, just in case this goes horribly wrong. Normally these uh, batteries are somewhat less vicious than uh, this, the lithium cells. They've got a higher impedance, these little ones, from my experience, although who knows. They've got a really bad tendency. That before uh, lithium became all the rage, the fairly standard battery was the sealed lead acid and rechargeable applications like alarm systems. I'm not sure how well this is going to open. It's cracked at one side. It really has stoved in at one side. Um, and their main failure mode was to, uh, if they vented, they'd fill up with uh, hydrogen and oxygen. And uh, then when you went in and you had a spark or something, if something happened, they would detonate forcibly with the hydrogen and oxygen. Oh, that smells very eggy right now. 
and they would just blow acid all over the place. That could happen with this. That's why I've got my glasses on, as always, just because uh, it's always good to have a little bit of protection. This is also charged up. That's probably a bad idea. Oh, this is not opening easily. I may have to pause momentarily while I go in deeper. It seems to be quite well stuck together. It is glued together, the case. Oh, there we go. Well, that is kind of, well, ugh. Yeah, I can see acid on my fingers already here. Let's not get acid all over my clothing. So what do we have? We have the acid-soaked electrodes here. I assume it's lead acid. It looks like lead acid. With the two cells kind of like butted up to each other and that sort of filler, which looks... I don't know what that is. It could be fine fiberglass material with the lead electrodes there. Bridged together and then uh, just that soaked with sulfuric acid, which smells very eggy indeed. Yeah, it looks like a... I wonder if they've just done this for cheapness because, let's face it, it's a very, very cheap way of making a cell. Two electrodes with this sort of material in between them and then they're sort of joined together to create that uh, that battery. Interesting. Much simpler. Maybe, maybe this is it. Maybe it just is a cheaper way to make a battery. It is just those lead plates with the acid-soaked material between them. Oh, that is very, very noxious smelling. So yeah, I guess it is just a cost-saving thing. So that is a very odd and cheap and slightly nasty thing. I have to say, this spot didn't seem to be holding a huge charge. It lost intensity very quickly. Um, I'm guessing it's just down to the fact they had used a super cheap battery and uh, were abusing it a bit, although it still feels relatively moist. Yeah, this uh, still has quite a lot of acid in it. So yeah, very interesting. Interesting purely because it was such a cheap and nasty sort of economy version of the lamp, but using some very clever circuitry.